I'm not hosting today, but I begged Jason, can you please let me introduce Charlie Morley? Because I have worked with so many teachers and so many practices, and Charlie Morley's work has changed my life in a way that nothing else ever has. And I don't know how many of you are actually familiar or have ever actually trained in lucid dreaming. You can put your hand up. It's very few of us, yeah. And for those of you who don't understand what lucid dreaming is, I'm sure Charlie might go into it a little bit, but we're talking here about Web3 and the metaverse and VR and AR. When you get lucid in your own dreams, you are in a high definition virtual reality of your own psyche. And you know, I, under Charlie's work through his books, but also I was lucky enough to work with him one-on-one, -on -one, truly that work changed my life. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with Charlie, he is a best-selling author and teacher of lucid dreaming, but also of shadow integration, and also of mindfulness of dream and sleep. And I love having someone as amazing as, as him being an advocate and a voice for you know, this incredible ancient practices because he's actually authorized to teach in the Kagu tradition of Tibetan Buddhism by Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, who's an amazing, I just read his book, incredible story from Tibet, crossing over the mountains, you know, who's been teaching this. Um, and so Charlie teaches within that Tibetan tradition and working with these incredible liminal spaces of sleeping and dreaming. And uh, you know he's taught everywhere from like Oxford and Cambridge and the Ministry of Defence and you know the Houses of Parliament places. You're like, whoa, such edgy stuff. And lucid dreaming, true. Like I mean, I know a lot of us here have done plant medicines, but lucid dreaming is like a sober, built-in pathway. And beyond just lucid dreaming, all these different ways of accessing these parts of our conscious mind and conscious experiences that are available to us. And truly, as I said, Charlie changed my life. And I'm really excited because he's actually going to share today about how to use one of those liminal spaces that are available to us. One of my favorite practices, my personal growth practice, which is napping. <laughs> um, and for those of us here, you know, on day three, you're probably going to start feeling tired. And it's a great time to practice what you're going to learn here with Charlie today. And again, I really encourage all of us to, rather than just using, you know, plant medicines and this and that, to be super curious about how we can access these incredible other parts of our consciousness through these sober pathways that are available. So Charlie again changed my life. He's an extraordinary man. Please welcome Charlie Morley. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, if you're interested in lucid dreaming, then actually tomorrow morning I'm doing like an immersive lucid dreaming in one of the, ba in one of the breakout groups. So uh, in one of the breakout rooms. So if you want to experience uh, creating a dream plan and having a hypnagogic experience, that'll be tomorrow. But for now, I got 20 minutes to talk to you about the amazing benefits of napping. Now I hope that by the time you finish this talk, you're all, gonna, you're all going to want to go and take a nap. It would be really good if you can stay awake for the next 20 minutes. But of course, if anyone down the front does start falling asleep, I'll take it as a great compliment. I'll be like, they love it so much, they're napping already. Okay, so napping. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I, I never used to nap. You know, I used to be like, oh, I'm too busy wanting to change the world, I've got no time for napping. Now I realize if you really want to change the world, take a nap. You are better at anything you do after a nap, really. Uh, uh, you can really change the world and change your relationship to people in the world if you can give yourself time to take a nap. Um, and before we begin, just uh, the definition of a nap. So a nap can be defined as any short period of sleep outside of your main monophasic sleep cycle. So nowadays in the West, most of us sleep what's called monophasically, which means all in one big chunk, usually at night. Now, before the Industrial Revolution, we did not sleep that way. And many in indigenous cultures still do not sleep that way, but that's a whole other talk. But for now, we'll define a nap as any short period of sleep outside of that main chunk you have at night. And when I'm talking naps, I'm talking between 20 to 60 minutes of sleep. In fact, they found you can get improvements from just a five-minute nap, but 20 to 60 minutes is, is pretty good. So, where's my clicker? Okay. So the first amazing benefit of napping is you will live longer. You will stay on this planet longer if you take naps. You will not die as soon as other people who do not take naps. It really is that simple. Like, I fucking love life, right? I want some more of it. Who here loves life? Yeah, fucking love life. 
If you want more life, and not just a longer life, but a healthier life within that length, take a nap. And there is science on this. All the science, scientific studies I'm gonna share are mainstream, so there's no room for, for debate. The first one is Harvard Medical School. Harvard Medical School found that there was a 37% decrease in heart disease among habitual nappers. So a habitual napper was someone who napped like three or more times a week. 37% less likely to die of heart disease. Now when they focused on men, it more than doubled. There was a 68% decrease in heart disease among men who nap habitually. Now I was running this talk past a doctor friend of mine and they confirmed that there is no known medication currently available, no pill you can take, that can reduce a man's chances of dying of heart disease by 68%. There's no pill, but there is a medication, and the medication is taking a nap. Each day, or as many times through the week as you can, going to sleep in the middle of the day for 20 to 60 minutes. They did another study in Switzerland. This one was really cool because it was a big study, 3,000 people, right? randomly selected from the Swiss population ages 35 to 75. And what they found was, again, direct correlations between people not dying and those who had naps. Even people who just had one nap a week had a 42% less likelihood of dying of heart disease, stroke, and heart attacks. Those are like three of the biggest killers in the Western world. And this was just taking a nap once a week. So really, the jury is in. If you want to live longer, take a nap. The next one, this is cool. You will be 34% better at anything after a nap. This study was from NASA. Freaking NASA are studying naps, right? And the reason I can say 34% better at anything was because astronauts have to do loads of different things. So they were giving them 40 minute naps and then testing athletic endurance, cognitive ability, spatial awareness, all these different kind of things. And they found that you were better at pretty much anything, 34% better, after a 40 minute nap. So if you are a doctor, if you are an athlete, if you are a life coach, if you are Vishen Lakhiani himself, you can be better at your life coaching, your doctoring, your athleticism, and your Vishen Lakhianiing after a 40 minute nap. This is all about life optimization, right? That's what AFEST is about. Being better, more loving, more kind, more energetic, connected people. A nap can help you do that. Oh, they found another study that uh, these improvements in cognition lasted about two hours after a nap. So you have a nap and then you've got this two hour window where you're, you're better at loads of stuff. Now for those of you listening who are thinking, I don't feel better after a nap. Does anyone have a nap and then feel really sleepy afterwards, like groggy? Ah, okay, so this is called sleep inertia. And it's basically due to do with the hormones in your body. There's like melatonin and serotonin, right? And sometimes due to the timing of your nap or how tired you were before you had the nap, sometimes you can wake up and still feel a bit groggy for a few minutes afterwards. This rarely lasts more than five or 10 minutes and there is a very quick way to switch it off. If you wake up from a nap still feeling groggy or when you wake up in the morning after sleep feeling groggy, expose yourself to sunlight. Stand outside, not inside. They found the inside with all the lights on was still not as strong in the amount of lumens, which is the amount of kind of um, light particles in the air, as standing outside on a cloudy day. So even if it's cloudy, the sunlight still comes through and that will reset and allow you to kind of wake up after your nap. Um, who here regularly naps? Okay, we've got a room full of, okay, so that's like maybe just under half the people who nap. This is very, very good. And again, I hope by the end of this talk, you'll all be convinced to go and have a nap. Okay, this one's cool. You will be less pissed off after a nap. This is such a cool study. It's all based around this part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala, which is the threat center of the brain. It's almost called the fear center. This isn't quite right. It's about threat. But there's an interesting connection there, right? We fear what we are threatened by. So actually it is the same. It's an interesting philosophical point. We fear what we're threatened by. So where is the amygdala in the brain? If you got two arrows and you put them through your eyeballs and through your ears, the points where they would meet, you would find your amygdala. There are actually two things, but let's call it the amygdala. And the amygdala is your threat center. After a night of poor sleep or no sleep, so less than four hours sleep a night, the next day your amygdala, your threat center, is 60% more reactive. 
So you are 60% more likely to be pissed off if you didn't sleep well last night. Who didn't sleep well last night? Who got like less than four hours sleep? Okay, so we've got a few people. Okay, so um, have you been pissed off today? Has anyone been pissing you off? Yeah, she, 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 I'm just sensitive. I'm not, anyone been pissing you off? He's always pissed off. Okay. Perfect guy on the front row. I'm always pissed off. But he seems to be liking the talk, so that's good, right? Okay, so um, it wasn't their fault. It was your fault. No, it wasn't your fault. It was your brain's fault. It was nobody's fault. If you didn't sleep well last night, you are likely to be more easily pissed off. But here's the cool bit. If you can find a way to get a cheeky one-hour sleep, nap, siesta, whatever you want to call it, the next day, you will reset the amygdala. So you'll go from 60% reactivity to zero. It completely resets it. So we've got long days here at Mine Valley. You're like, it, it, you know, you're, you've got information being parted all day, then you're partying hard at night from the, from the stories I saw on Instagram last night. And tonight, again, we've got like the Bedouin experience, right? So have a disco nap. You know, this is when I used to go raving and take loads of drugs, we used to call it disco naps, you know? <laughs> You kind of go and like have a little nap and then you could stay up all night raving. So have a disco nap before tonight. Um, oh, this is a very cool study. University of California did a study that um, they, they found this amygdala thing from. They gave people eight hours sleep and then they give them cognitive ability tests. So how well is your brain working after eight hours sleep? And most people work pretty well. Then you give them four hours sleep and you give them the same test. Of course, they like do really badly on the test because they've only had four hours sleep. Then, the people who've only had four hours sleep, you give them a 60-minute nap that day, and you give them the same test again. They get roughly the same marks as if they had had eight hours sleep. That is the most optimistic piece of sleep research I've ever come across, and I've written four books on it. That's the most optimistic piece. Because I know when I used to have insomnia myself, when you're lying there, one of the worst things for me is like, tomorrow's ruined. Oh, tomorrow's fucking ruined, man. I, why do I even go into work? I'm going to be terrible. My amygdala is going to be triggered, all this kind of stuff. But now they prove that if you can find a way to have a one-hour nap, not all is lost. You can reset your brain to the same level as if you had had eight hours sleep. Um, let's look at the timing of naps here, right? So when I'm talking about naps, let's keep it 60 minutes or under. You can go up to 90 minutes, but you don't want to go over 90 minutes. So keep your nap, I'd say you know, 60 minutes is a good time. If you want to go up to 90 minutes, that's okay, but no more than that. If you sleep for more than 90 minutes, you will end up rolling over into deep sleep and you'll wake up with serious sleep inertia. Also, there was a study that came out earlier this year um, that had a link between Alzheimer's and excessive napping. Something about that study. The average age in that study was 77 years old. So this is older people, and the average nap time was 2.5 hours. So yeah, if you're in old age and you're sleeping for like two or three hours a day, that could be a sign. Actually, it wasn't a sign that it gave you dementia, it was a sign of dementia, that it could actually be an, uh, indicative of that. Um, so that's freaked some people out and they've started to think the naps aren't good, but that was one study and it was much older people and much longer naps. Um, so keep it about 60 minutes, it's gonna be fine. Okay, you will sleep deeper. This is an interesting one. When I first started doing talks and workshops, and I, you know, I lived in a Buddhist center for like eight years. That's where I did my training. I have no academic training. My training was with the, the, the Buddhist lamas uh, in the Buddhist center. And when they first sent me out to start teaching, uh, and I was looking at sleep and dreams, and especially lucid dreaming, the jury was out on this. You know, there are a lot of people saying that if you are an insomniac or you have troubled sleep, you shouldn't have naps because it messes with your circadian rhythms, it messes with your serotonin and melatonin levels, you won't be able to sleep at night. The last 10 years, there have been more neurobiological studies into sleep than the last 100 years put together. So now we have a lot more information, and the jury is in. As long as your nap meets the two golden guidelines, there are zero contraindications to regular siestas. What are those two golden guidelines? Number one, make sure your nap is 60 minutes or less. Number two, Make sure your nap, this is crucial, make sure your nap finishes at least six hours before your intended bedtime. So if you intend to go to bed at midnight tonight, make sure you finish napping by 6 p.m. It's due to something called sleep pressure, which is a biological function of the brain. Um, it's basically the biological function of tiredness. It takes about six hours for sleep pressure to build up. So have you noticed that often it's six hours after you wake up in the morning that you might feel a little bit tired? 
You wake up at 9 o'clock in the morning, maybe 3 p.m., you have a little dip, that's sleep pressure in action. So it takes about six hours to build up. So as long as your nap gives you those six hours, uh, it won't have any detrimental effect on your sleep the next day. Um, in fact, it will actually make you sleep better. What about, though, people who can't nap? Anyone here try a nap and they just can't do it? Okay, don't worry, I've got something for you guys too. There is a brilliant burgeoning field of something called NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. NSDR, a term pioneered by Professor Huberman from Stanford University. Uh, first used actually in his brilliant podcast, the Huberman Podcast. And non-sleep deep rest is any form of deep relaxation just before sleep. So you know if you're in the hypnagogic state, your eyes are closed, you're really drowsy, you're getting the nodding dog, maybe some people sitting on the uh, beanbags might be in that state already, right? Your brain goes into deep alpha and theta. These are the same brain waves of hypnosis. It's very, very good for you. So even if you can't nap, there are profound benefits from just lying down on the floor for 20 to 60 minutes with your eyes closed. You don't have to sleep. This could be yoga nidra, you know, the formal practice of lying down meditation. It could be what I teach in the quest, hypnagogic mindfulness. It could be even like a really relaxing aromatherapy massage, not like a deep tissue where it's keeping you awake, but a really relaxing aromatherapy where you're kind of half asleep while it's happening. That would count as non-sleep deep rest. Just lying down on the sofa for 20 minutes counts. And the reason why non-sleep deep rest is so good for you is something called parasympathetic drive. This is a cool one. Parasympathetic drive describes this kind of rechargeable battery in your brain which helps you sleep at night. Every time you do anything relaxing during the day, you, you zap, you charge up the parasympathetic drive battery. This is why you tend to sleep better on vacation, unless you've got kids. Uh, most of the time, when you're on vacation, you're doing more relaxing things than in everyday life. So every time you do anything relaxing, you zap up the battery. And then when it's time to go to bed at night, the more charge that this parasympathetic drive battery has, the quicker you will fall asleep and the longer you will stay asleep for. So scientific studies have found if you can spend a solid 30 minutes or even 60 minutes a day doing something deeply relaxing like yoga nidra, the shavasana bit at the end of yoga, just lying down with your eyes closed, doing something really relaxing like having a massage that charges up that battery and will actually help you sleep better at night too. So even if you can't nap, you can nap. Even if you can't nap, you can rest and that's still really good for you too. Okay, and the final slide, and we've got five minutes for this, this is brilliant. You will lucid dream. Okay, who here has done, uh, has anyone done my Mind Valley quest, the lucid dreaming quest? Can we have a whoop for the lucid dreaming questers? Whoop, whoop. Okay, um, if you haven't done it, you should do it. It's fucking good. Um, and that's not just me saying, no, it's, it's Mind Valley. You know, my teachings are fine, but the way they produce those quests, man, it's like Netflix. It's like such high production values. And it's very fun. We have a lot of fun in that quest. Um, so, wait, you tell me, what is a lucid dream? Mia told us. You're awake while you sleep. So has anybody here had a dream where in the dream you're like, oh shit, I'm, I'm awake, I'm conscious, I'm dreaming. Anyone had that? Okay, that was a lucid dream. So once that happens, you are conscious within the unconscious. You are conscious within the unconscious. So if that sounds a little bit like hypnotherapy, it should. And essentially, because I've only got a few minutes, the elevator pitch is anything you can treat through hypnotherapy, you can also treat through lucid dreaming. You can work with phobias, you can work with post-traumatic stress disorder, you can increase confidence, you can increase athletic uh, capacity. I was part of a study where we had to go into the lucid dream and practice our martial arts. And then they tested us before, go into the lucid dream, practice martial arts, they test you afterwards. 81.3% of the 25 people in the study got better at martial arts by training in their dreams. That is matrix style stuff. Now the reason I share that is because it's good for my ego. I was one of the 29, 11% or whatever who didn't get any better. I did it, I got lucid, I did the special kicks, but they tested me, I didn't get any better. But that's nuts, you can actually get better at stuff through lucid dreaming. How does lucid dreaming link to napping? Okay, when you go to sleep at night, you go through a certain sequence of sleep stages, usually hypnagogic, light sleep, deep sleep, then dream. Dream comes at the end of a cycle. When you have a nap or a siesta, you actually go straight into dream. You go straight from hypnagogic, bam, into dream. You notice that, how quickly you dream when you have a siesta, right? So that's really good for lucid dreaming because it means your entry into the dream state is swift and it's quick. I know a few people, not a lot, but maybe half a dozen people who their entire lucid dreaming practice is done in naps. Two are self-employed, two are mums, 
Um, they don't have time to do it at night because they've got their kids and their work and stuff, so they have naps during the day, and that's where they do the majority of their lucid dreaming practice. This isn't new. The Chinese Taoists, of course, we heard about Chinese Taoist practice with a, a wonderful speaker before. The Chinese Taoists were really into lucid dreaming, and they had something called the, uh, the uh, nap of the sleeping tiger. And the nap of the sleeping tiger was basically to have loads of naps during the day, like two or three naps, not only so you could have two or three more chances to practice the spiritual practice of lucid dreaming and dream yoga, but also by the time you went to sleep at night, you weren't fatigued. You weren't going to sleep because you were too tired to stay awake. You were going to sleep because you were ready to do your spiritual practice. That's a very different take on sleep. If you can get to the point where you're not going to sleep because you're fatigued, but you're going to sleep because it's time to do your spiritual practice, that will transform your life very, very quickly. So that's great for lucid dreaming. Um, so to conclude, Napping's really fucking good for you. Please, everybody go and take a nap. It will make you live longer. It will make you 34% better at anything you do. It'll make you less pissed off. Uh, it'll help with lucid dreaming. It'll help you sleep deeper and better at night. It's really good for you, so why aren't we doing it? Imagine a world where more of us took naps. You know, college students would get better grades. Business people would make better trades. Politicians would make less amygdala-affected decisions about how to help the people in Ukraine. And yet, we all want to change the world, right? So if you really want to change the world, take a nap. Thank you very much. <laughs>